Okay? And the Kuhnman John is a convolution is defined just like this. Basically, we apply a, a template to attach the result in this coordinates. One of the difficulties with this approach with polar coordinates in general that basically the rotation is not well defined. Right? So basically this is how it looks like. So this is a patch extracted from the point. This is the template. Basically, if I don't have a good way of defining what is theta zero, some reference orientation, I could not keep this page in arbitrary way. Okay, so basically there is no tension in the Now you could of course define some uh, uh, some canonic rotation. So I will show it next. So you can use some information that usually will be extrinsic, for example, the principal curvature direction, or you can just consider all the possible orientations. Okay. So this is what we did in this work. We considered all the possible orientations. We kept these results, so the conversion produced the result for all possible rotations, and then we took the maximum over all the possible rotations. We called it Algebra Max Pooling. Okay. Nowadays, I would say that it's not the smartest idea, but it worked pretty nicely. So, this is a two example of geodesic conversion neural network. Basically, here the signal leaves at each point on the, of the surface. Usually we use some geometric features, for example, some local history of normals. You can use texture, you can use anything you want. You can use maybe some spectral characteristics like uh, location eigenvectors or geometric vectors. So basically the network operates point lights unless you use some pooling. Okay. <coughs> and basically this is here it's a linear layer and this is a convolutional layer. Okay. And you can you can concatenate as many layers like this as you want. Now, basically, here we have a general system that allows you to learn some features, local features on the, on the surface. So you can use it for different applications. For example, we can learn descriptors. Okay. So, how do we learn descriptors? We assume to be given a set of shapes with known correspondences between points. So here, corresponding points are denoted by similar colors. Red point, the blue point, and the green point. Okay. Basically, the uh, network output denoted here by F, and that is the set of parameters of the network, is a local descriptor. So I want the corresponding points on my training set, the descriptors, to be as similar as possible. That's this term, okay. X and X plus denote what is called positive pairs. So these are pairs of corresponding points. <coughs> And on non corresponding points, we have x and x minus called negatives. I want the descriptors to be as far as possible and actually far by some margin. And we minimize this together. So, technically, how it's done basically, we have what is called the Siamese architecture. So, two identical copies of the network <coughs> sharing the same parameters. Basically, we fill it with a pair of inputs and we compare their outputs. And the loss that is minimized is this. How do you define the negative examples? I mean, that's arbitrary, right? I, any any non-corresponding point, and like the results won't it depend on how you define your non-corresponding points? Of course, the results will depend very much on the training set. It will depend very much on how you define the negative examples. So usually, in general, it, it could be some random points, it could be some sufficiently distant points, or this could be actually difficult measures. So, for example, there will be points that are difficult to disambiguate. Is it possible that when I, in the, when I define the negative examples, they have features which also look like the positive examples? I mean, how do you it is possible for yeah, So, there, there could be some label noise unless you have some smart way of constructing this training set. Okay, so this is an example how the descriptors look like. So what I show here is a heat map. So basically I take a point on the shoulder, I look at the descriptor at this point, I compare to the descriptors at all the rest of the points of the same shape and other shapes. And I plot this distance, saturating it at some point, at some level. Okay. So this is one of the popular handcrafted descriptors called heat kernel signature used in computer graphics. You see that it's very smooth. If I move a little bit away from the point, the descriptor almost doesn't change. So this descriptor is very bad for <coughs> correspondence because for correspondence you want know, descriptor that is very localized. 
another popular descriptor called wave kernel signature. You see that it's much better localized if we move away from the point. The descriptor becomes different, but it's not very specific. So there are other points in completely different parts of the shape that looks like the shoulder, which is also not good. This is optimal spectral descriptor. So this is the work of Alex and Roy Lieben. Basically, they try to learn the optimal uh, uh, the optimal transfer function. Basically, they, they look at uh, a generalization of heat kernel signature and wave kernel signature with, with parametric filters. So it looks better than HTS and WKS, but still not perfect. This is the geodesic CNN. Okay. So you see that it's much better localized and much more specific. Here in particular, we didn't distinguish at that point between left and right symmetric points. So it is ambiguous to, to reduce symmetry. It doesn't need to be explained. At least in this work, we, we didn't do it. Okay, and here are just some evaluations showing the performance of the descriptor. So CMC, community matching characteristic. Basically, we look first at the closest matches and we see how many of them are correct correspondences. So the higher the curve is the better. You can see that we are much better than the handcrafted descriptors. This is our C curve, basically the threshold, the descriptor distance at some level. And we look at the trade off between false positives and false negatives. Again, the higher the better. This is the genetic CNN. And this is the Princeton Beach Park. So here we look at the first, uh, the closest match, the first nearest neighbor. And we look at the percentage of correspondence, correct correspondences that fall within certain error radius, geodesic distance. That is expressed as percentage of the geodesic diameter of the shape. Again, the higher the better. So you can see that it is pretty significant improvement over previous 10,000 features and previous neural features as well. <coughs> now, that was one application that basically. We could learn descriptors and then use the descriptors to find correspondence between shapes. We can learn the correspondence directly. So, for this purpose, you can consider correspondence as a labeling problem. So, basically, take a collection of shapes, choose one of these shapes as your label space. It doesn't need to be shape, it's just convenient to think of it as shape, but it's just some abstract space of indices. Okay. So, this I would call this the reference shape. Okay, and you know my why. And basically, I want to label each point on my query shape, point X, with a point on the reference shape Y. Okay? And basically, this labeling creates a correspondence. So basically, the, the output of the neural network at each point, F of X, could be produced and interpreted as a probability distribution on the reference Y. So the last layer will be a softmax layer. And we'll produce something that looks like probability. Okay. So we want this probability to be as thick as possible and the peak to appear at the ground of correspondence point, which I denote here by Y star. Okay. So this is a standard classification problem. We can uh, train the network by minimizing the logistic regression cost. <coughs> it looks like this. It's nothing else but the Kulbeck library divergence, the statistical distance between two distributions. The ground of the distribution is delta at y star and the actual distribution that is produced by the network. Okay, and this is how it looks like if you compare these methods to some standard correspondence methods that, uh, that exist in the literature. So this is the symmetric Princeton wage market. Uh, it ignores symmetric correspondences, basically. It considers them as correct matches. So this is some result of correspondence produced by geodesic CNN. What is B? Sorry. B? Blended intrinsic maps. The method of Lippmann and Foucault. And RF is not enforced. Okay. I will show much better results. That's why I'm saying that this is obsolete. So here, <coughs> the visualization of correspondence using the color map, the same colors that code corresponding points. Now, third application is, uh, so far basically we didn't do any pooling, right? Basically, we wanted to create a descriptor for each point on the shape. In some cases, we want to create a descriptor that is uh, that, that holds for the entire shape, if you want to classify shapes. <coughs> so there are several ways of doing pooling. 
the simplest way that we use in this paper was to compute a covariance. So here the network until some point produces features at each point, two-dimensional features. We compute their covariance features. And basically this is our discrete. Basically here at this point we lose all the geometric structure. It's a kind of pulling that basically breaks, aggregates all the local information. And again we can train it on uh, some examples of positives and negatives shaped belonging to the same class or different classes. So this is a rather simple two example classification of different sub uh, subjects from the Faust dataset. And you can see that it dramatically outperforms uh, can craft the descriptors. Just to give you an example, this is my quick shape. And these are the shapes that look similar to it if we use the heat kernel signature descriptor. Now, I don't know how good you are in distinguishing shapes in 3D, but these two are actually different people. It's hard to say. But to me, they look the same. This one is obviously different, but these two are different. This is what we get with Geodesic Sienna. It's much better performance. All the first patients are called. It's kind of different poses of the same subject. Not very interesting example. We didn't test it on bigger data sets, which are probably good. So the next thing, this is actually a recent paper that will appear in NIPS this year as well, are constructions of uh, conventional neural networks using an isotropic diffusion process. So we've seen already the diffusion equation, right? It looked like this. So this was <coughs> homogeneous diffusion equation, right? Remember we called C the thermal diffusivity constant. And we assume that it's fixed in the space. So each point of our surface conducts the heat in the same way. Now, we can replace this constant with a matrix that is called heat conductivity tensor that basically models a behavior that is position and direction dependent. So we can conduct heat differently in each direction at each point. Just to give you an example, this is how isotropic homogeneous diffusion looks like. And this is how the anisotropic diffusion looks like. Okay, so you see here that Basically, the vertical direction, whatever it is, local vertical direction, has preference. So diffusion flows faster in certain directions on the main fold. Okay. Now I remind you that everything is here on the main fold. So the gradient is a tangent vector field. So basically, the gradient is a vector in the tangent space. And basically, this is topic. Uh, uh, the anisotropic tensor is just a matrix that does something to this gradient vector at each point. Okay. In particular, we consider a matrix that looks like this. We take the gradient direction rotated by angle theta, we scale it by a factor alpha and rotate it back by theta. Okay. So this bit creates some isotropy that looks like this. Now it's a good question how to select the reference direction for this theta. Basically, you need some smooth vector field on your manifold to serve as the reference. For example, we can use the principal curvature direction that is piecewise smooth. Now, this is extrinsic information, but it's local, so it works pretty well. And then we call this the anisotropic population. It now has uh, two parameters, alpha and theta. So, theta is the orientation, and alpha is the elongation, the level of anisotropy. And we can define heat kernels with this notation exactly in the same way as we did before, just take eigenfunctions and eigenvalues. This will be the anisotropic heat kernel. So it has three parameters, the scale, parameter t, right, time, the orientation theta, it rotates it, and the elongation alpha. Squeeze it. Alpha equals zero corresponds to the standard isotopic case. Zero or one? Zero in this case. Oh. One. In this case it's one. Okay. So basically we use these kernels as local weights of the patient crater, right? As we did before with the geodesic scan, and now we use uh, these weights, the heat, the anisotropic heat kernels are used as the weights, where theta can be interpreted as the angular coordinate, and t as the radial coordinate. And the rest is exactly the same, what we call anisotropic convolution. It's basically extracting from this patient crater, multiplying it by a template. Okay? So, here actually, because we have the orientation, right? Basically, we fix the orientation. It will discriminate between symmetric points. 
this bilateral asymmetric points. So basically a point on the right shoulder and the left shoulder will be oriented in in the uh, opposite way. So basically this descriptor automatically has uh, it has the capability of discriminating between symmetries. And you can see it here. Michael, practically you are using the principal curvature? We are using the principal curvature. But this is an unstable point. Well it is stable. Right. You can smooth it very very yeah, strongly. Yeah. I agree that this is extrinsic, but everything is local here, so it doesn't really matter. You can use any small field of manifold. It would be interesting, actually, what would be <coughs> some good canonical intrinsic field? Maybe a field of vector, for example. So for example, I have the hand, and then my uh, curvature would, I mean, the principal curvature would uh, direct and I agree. fold it. I agree, so it's, it is not completely incorrect to be folded. Uh, there are no intrinsic deformations, isometric deformations anyway. In for particle purposes. The killing fields. I don't know, but maybe maybe the field of vector, first time vector of the operation. We didn't play with it too much. It worked. It's probably scarf. because of the learning part. It's a scarf. What? The field of vector. You can look at the gradient of the direction. Okay. So this is exactly the same heat map. So we took the point on the shoulder, compare the discrete with this point, so the features that are produced by the network to the features that all the rest of the points. You see that it's very specific and very well localized. And also uh, uh, discriminate, discriminates between symmetric points. So this is how it looks. So this is the correspondence performance. So here we're ignoring the correspondence as I showed before as a classification problem. So just to give you an idea, this is blended intrinsic map. This is random forest. Uh, this is GCNN. This is an isotropic CNN. Okay. So it's very good. You can actually see that. Above sixty percent of points you have zero correspondence error. Yeah. What is the difference between HCNN and GCNN? Uh, in GCNN, you learn the filters of the patch, right? Here is the same thing. Uh, so Here is the same thing. Yes. Except that what's the, the patch is considered different. The weights of the patch. Okay. Do you feel all the orientations? Yeah. We discretize to sixteen orientations. It, it, it implies that you need to compute 16 different populations and compute their ideal vectors. Okay, so it's a very good performance. Basically, you can see here that, let's say, this is about 2% of geodesic diameter, it's about 4 centimeters, I think, on the, let's say, average human shape, so more or less length of the finger. So that's the maximum error that we get in this approach. Would this generalize also well across data sets? So if I have a human in Tosca and a human in FOSS? I will show some results. Okay, so this was the symmetric benchmark. Okay. So symmetric benchmark means that symmetric correspondences are considered as correct. The more challenging benchmark is the asymmetric version. And you can see that, for example, a random forest that is based on wave kernel signatures uh, degrades dramatically. Basically, they are uh, uh, ambiguous symmetries. And this method is as stable as a rock. So some examples of correspondence that can be obtained uh, with this method. So this is actually in combination with partial function maps that some of you might have seen. I gave this talk uh, a week ago. So this we can deal with quite extreme cases of correspondence. You can see that this dog is very suffering, basically there's almost nothing that can make in this shape. Still the correspondence is very nice. And these are some curves that evaluate the performance on these things. Okay, so let me should finish with the uh, mixture model networks, the non-net, so that's the new architecture that, that, uh, that we appeared in archive just a few days ago. Basically, we have also results with shapes. So I show these graphs that we show you results with shapes. So the idea here is very simple. We construct local geodesic coordinates, raw and data, as we did before. Here we also fix the orientation to the, the theta zero is the principal, the maximum curvature direction. We use Gaussian weight functions. Okay. U here is two-dimensional, right? We assume that the covariance is a diagonal matrix. So we have basically four parameters for each curve. Uh, and the pitch operator is just, just this, what we've seen before. Okay, so basically we apply these weights to produce local version of the function. Now, if you look at it as a polar plot, basically 
This is how GCN waits look like. Okay, so the fixed blobs, fixed Gaussians, a different data row. This is how the ACN kernels look like. Right? So these are heat kernels of different orientation, different scale. These are the optimal <coughs> kernels that we learn. So this can be parameters of a normal. You see that it's neither this or that. It's actually remarkable that they are almost symmetric. But they're not exactly symmetric. Okay. So this is the best thing that we learn with this architecture. And as I showed before, this is a generalization, so you can write GCMN and ACMN as particular instances of modet with these kind of kernels. So this is the performance that we get. Now Faust is becoming boring. We get about 90% of correspondence, accurate correspondence is at zero. And well, here also the, we, uh, we roll to the axis at centimeters on the reference shape. So the largest error approximately we get is four centimeters. Okay, so if this looked to you very good, actually now I have also changed the scale of the plot. Now it goes to 20 centimeters, 10%. Diameter, you can get much better, so this result is much better. I think currently it's at least in this page where I can state of there, it's almost perfect. Just to give you an idea, a different visualization how the error looks like. So this is point wise geodesic error. Okay. <coughs> Shown is percentage of geodesic diameters, 7.5. 7.5 would correspond to approximately something like 15 centimeters. Okay. So this is better than the map. I saturate the error just for visualization purposes. So it looks very bad, actually. Uh, most of the points have error of order of several centimeters, or even more than 10 centimeters. So this is the work of Hickman from 20 years ago. This is the geodesic CNN. You see that there are sparse sets of points where there is large error, but there are many points where the error is almost zero. Or actually zero. Okay. This is the ACN. See quite dramatic improvements from GCN to ACN. Still, there are some points with large errors. This is what we can read on it. It's very small errors, almost everything is zero. Another way of visualizing correspondence is by texture mapping. So, we take texture on the reference shape, we map it to the query shape, and you can see that the texture is pretty much almost perfect. There are maybe a few artifacts here and there, but overall, this is a very good correspondence. Can we compare this to, these, to the new filtering tools? Not yet. Because there we get more than... But you can apply it. So I don't think it's self contradicting you can apply it to the filter to That's what I think. Yeah. Yeah. Apply, yeah. I'm sure it will improve the speed. Of course. What, is, what should be done is learning for your filter. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, more interesting results. Here we have range images. So, Faust is not interesting because all the shapes have the same triangulation. So, you can say that somehow you learn the, the mesh. So here is a more challenging example. These are range maps produced from Faust. And here we have everything, missing data, different topologies. So you can see, for example, that here the hands are glued to the body. Here the leg is glued to the body. Here the leg is <coughs> are glued and the arms are glued. And this is the correspondence. So this is seven, again 7.5% of geodesic diameter. The errors are very small. Still bigger than the previous case, but here we should also see because the mesh is different, our way of our ground truth is inaccurate because we take the nearest table. Basically, we take the, the range map and we basically extrinsically compare to the to the to the shape that from which it originated. And basically, the the grid size in the uh, in the range map is basically the bound on our error. So here we, we have few uh, few points with zero error, but actually zero is meaningless here. It's the, it's the size of the of the pixel in the range map that bounds here. And this is the visualization of the correspondence as uh, colors. <laughs> and it looks very nice. So here, training was done on uh, the training and testing were done on the different uh, disjoint subsets of Faust. To your question, here we also show results on other data sets. So you can train Faust and test and scale in Boston. It still looks nice. So it generalizes pretty well other humans from other data sets. It doesn't work well with humans with clones. Humans with? With clones. With but not surprising. Basically, we need a much richer data set to train. Basically, the data set on which we train was something like 80 shapes. 
this is just to give you a, an idea. So there was last year there was a, actually this year at CPR there was paper of Cowley. He used standard equivalence here then on uh, uh, to find the shape correspondence between human shapes. The network consisted of 200 million parameters, mm -hmm. trained on 50 million images for two weeks. We trained on 80 shapes, which have maybe a few hundreds of thousands of parameters, and we trained a few hours. And the results, I think our results are better. We didn't compare them to them directly, it's different benchmark, different problem. But uh, basically that's, I think that this speaks or shouts in favor of building it a deformation invariance into the model, other than trying to learn it. <coughs> okay, I think I will stop here. And that will be the end. Thank you. If, for example, you are trying to apply this uh, name as the last one for gesture recognition of a hand, how would it work? Well, it's a different problem. Why? Well, because ingestion requires a lot of information, right? Yeah, I would like to uh, no, I would like to know which finger is which, and then I would know how to. Uh... That should work. But I would say that in this case you want to do it simultaneously, simultaneously by the same by the same by box. You you don't want to be insensitive to information. No, why? You can find the correspondence to the atlas and then do the registration. Yeah, yeah. you could. Yeah. I don't know. Didn't find. How fast would it work? So currently, well, it's done for meshes. You didn't do it for parametric surfaces. You see, what is the, this is actually a very good question. Uh, basically, here with range images, we should we should be taking into account the regular grid structure of the surface. So basically, we can think of it as a sliding window filter that is nonlinear that changes at each position. Currently, we consider it as basically as a mesh. So we build a method that works on arbitrary destruction of meshes. But for range images, for parametric surfaces more generally, for geometric images, you can take it into account by a degree structure. So that will be the next step. So <coughs> the input to the network, is it directly the embedding, like the XYZ coordinates or it's No, we use, uh, I didn't mention it, that's the shop descriptor. So each point is its local history of normals. I see. So at each point it's, uh, it's, 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 a, oh, it's a feature vector I think. Yeah. About 500 dimensions. How do you come? So, what's the analysis of that? Is it good to use the embedding? Is it good to use the short? Is it good to use eigenfunctions? Like so, we use short because it's it's a standard descriptor. We didn't play with it too much. It worked pretty well. So, what the problem with short? It depends very much on the on the termination. So, basically, what the network does it's it uh, corrects the crappy job that short does in this case of. Uh, this case of uh, of French maps. More questions? People are hungry. Thank you.